The world is full of all kinds of motion. Objects can move in straight lines, circles, or more complicated paths. Most of the objects we interact with, when pushed, move for a little while and then come to rest. But some things, when you give them a push, don't stop right away. They keep moving. And they don't just move in any pattern, they move in waves. And we didn't impose this motion on the object. All we did was start the motion. In fact, it doesn't matter how we start the motion, the weight will still move back and forth in a wave-like pattern. So somehow, built into this system, there must be instructions on how to move. The spring has already decided what its motion is going to be, and it doesn't really care how we get the motion going. But how can a system like this know how to move? And why does it choose to move with the motion of a wave? Is there something special or fundamental to nature about this shape, or is it just convenient in this case? Let's address the question of how the spring knows to move like a wave first. Newton's second law should be helpful here, which reminds us that if we're trying to figure out how something is moving, we should pay attention to the forces that are acting on the object. So we should probably know how much the spring is pushing on the mass. As we stretch or compress a spring, we expect the spring to push or pull back, and if we plot how much it pushes or pulls against how far we move it, many springs give us a nice linear graph. This relationship is known as Hooke's Law and can be written as f is equal to minus kx, where k is the spring constant, which tells us how rigid our spring is. The minus sign is a result of the force of the spring opposing our motion. The spring always pushes or pulls against us. Now that we have two equations, let's do the sensible thing here and put them together. We now have a mathematical machine that relates the position of the mass to its acceleration. The further our mass is away from equilibrium, the more the spring pushes or pulls on it. While a and x changes our spring moves, k and m are constant. m tells us how much our mass will accelerate when pushed a certain amount, and k tells us how much our spring will push back when displaced a certain amount. So if our math is right, and our physics is right, then somewhere in this equation there should be a wave hiding. I don't see it yet, but let's see what else we can figure out about our equation. We know that position and acceleration are connected somehow, because if I want to move something, accelerating it is a great place to start. However, accelerating an object does not immediately change its position. Instead, it changes its velocity, which in turn changes its position. Velocity is how much an object's position changes in a given amount of time and acceleration is how much an object's velocity changes in a given amount of time. We can write these mathematically in a few different ways. The important part for us is that for a given position of our mass, we can compute the acceleration from our force equation and then use our understanding of the connection between acceleration, velocity, and position to figure out where our mass is going to go next. Once our mass gets to the next spot, since the acceleration and position are changing, we need to repeat the process, again asking our equations where they predict the mass will go next. So, let's try it. We established that k and m are constants, so to make our math simpler, let's assume that our spring constant and mass are both 1. We'll start our mass with a position of 1 and a velocity of 0. The instant we release our mass, it experiences a force from the spring. That force accelerates the mass and changes its velocity in the direction of the force. But how much does the acceleration change the velocity? If we accelerate our mass with an acceleration of a for delta t seconds, we will change our velocity by delta t times a. Likewise, if our object experiences a velocity of v for delta t seconds, it will move a distance of v times delta t. We generally want delta to be small to produce accurate results, so let's let delta t be 0.1 seconds. So that's all well and good, but there's a small complication. Since velocity is changing, we need to think carefully about which velocity we're using. For the interval we cover in delta t seconds, it seems silly to use the velocity at the beginning or the end, since those don't really represent what happened over the interval. So instead, we'll use the velocity in the middle of the interval. We can now write a set of equations that we can use to determine how our position, velocity, and acceleration change over time as controlled by our spring. We can keep track of our results in a table. At time zero, our mass is not moving, and at position one meter. As soon as we let go, we know that since a is equal to minus x, our mass will be accelerated at a rate of minus one. 
This will give our mass a small amount of velocity in the negative direction, and this velocity will begin to move our mass. We can repeat the process over and over and follow the motion of our mass. Since there's a lot of repetitive calculations involved, and computers happen to be really good at that sort of thing, let's write some Python code to speed things up. We'll write a Python method that will take in the position at the beginning of the interval, and the velocity halfway through the previous interval. The method will then compute the acceleration and position at the end of the current interval, and the velocity halfway through the current interval. We can now run our method over and over, each time using the output from the last step as the input to the next step. As we plot our results, we see our familiar waveform emerge. So things are looking good. Our predicted motion matches our actual motion. But where do these wave shapes come from? Sure, they are the natural motion of an oscillator, as we just discovered, but you've probably seen them elsewhere before. We would like to know more about these shapes, and it would be nice to have a more convenient way to express them mathematically than just as a list of numbers as we have now. Let's try something weird for a moment. For each point in time we analyze, we know four things about it. Time, position, velocity, and acceleration. When plotting our points, we get to choose which quantities to plot on which axes. When we plot time on an axis, we are converting it to a spatial dimension and we see a nice waveform. But what if we don't plot time at all and instead plot position versus velocity? When we view our motion this way, we see the relationship between velocity and position are connected by a circle. The motion we set up starts on the far right side with zero velocity and a position of one. As the position decreases and our mass moves back towards equilibrium, the velocity increases in such a way that our position versus velocity graph exactly traces a circle. So it appears there is some relationship between the way oscillators move and circles. And that's what we're going to explore next time.